Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and I'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're investigating a quite famous and peculiar behavioral anomaly on stock markets that has been first discovered by Kamstra, Kramer and Levy in their seminal 2003 paper titled Winter Blues. This anomaly, as they argue, is associated with seasonal affective disorder, or SAD for short, and how it can be manifested in stock market participants' mood, risk aversion, and therefore impact stock market returns. Seasonal affective disorder is generally associated with lower mood of some people when daylight hours are relatively short and nighttime hours are relatively long. This, as you might know, happens across the year due to a change in seasons and a change in uh, daylight hours due to uh, sun's declination angle. Uh, the nights in the northern hemisphere are the longest in the winter solstice, which is end of December, and they slowly get longer coming up to the winter solstice, and after this date they go shorter again. And uh, they become the shortest and days become the longest during the summer solstice, around end of June. That's for northern hemisphere, it's completely the reverse for the southern hemisphere. However, as we are dealing with the US stock market today, we'll investigate whether the SAD anomaly is present on the US stock market using the data from year end 1927 all the way until year end 2022, so using almost a century worth of data, we will be interested in the Northern Hemisphere, and in particular, we'll be interested in the seasonal affective disorder effects on stock market participants' mood and risk aversion at the latitude of the New York Stock Exchange. The latitude of it is 40.71 uh, northern latitude. So we'll be able to calculate the length of nighttime hours at the latitude of the New York Stock Exchange for every single day in our sample, and that would allow us to calculate the intensity of the seasonal affective disorder effect that can affect stock market participants' mood and their risk aversion. Again, the hypothesis of Cancer, Kramer and Levy is that um, lower moods are associated with uh, higher risk aversion, lower risk tolerance, and that would require uh, the stock market to provide investors with higher returns during the period when they are affected by this sad anomaly. That would predict that the returns during autumn and winter would be higher than otherwise due to this particular behavioral effect, due to this change in investors' risk perception when they're affected by um, lower daylight times and they're generally having lower moods. Quite interestingly, this behavioral anomaly can provide an explanation for some well-known um, stock market um, peculiarities and other calendar anomalies that might not have got um, a satisfying uh, rational or behavioral explanation until Kamstra's paper, which is the, for example, sell and may and go away effect, uh, showing that returns are the highest from uh, November until April. This coincides quite nicely with the period where nights are the longest in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, it also provides an alternative explanation uh, for the January effect, as uh, January is also a month with relatively long nights in the Northern Hemisphere. So what Kamstra, Kramer and Levy suggest is to perform a regression of uh, stock market returns in uh, sample days onto the uh, seasonal affective disorder effect that can be calculated from the length of nighttime hours. So first of all, let's calculate our daily returns by dividing uh, the index value today by the index value yesterday, times it by 100. Let's calculate the returns in uh, percentages so that the results are more easily interpretable and subtract 100. That would allow us to calculate daily returns throughout the sample period. Now we need to calculate the sun's declination angle 
for every single sample day so that then we can calculate the length of nighttime hours. For that, the easiest uh, procedure would be to first calculate the Julian variable, which is the um, order number of a particular calendar day of the year. So for that, we can subtract from the date itself the start of the relevant year. So we use the date function as the year, we substitute the year of this particular date. And for the very first day in this year, well, as the, uh, the 1st of January, so January the 1st it is. And then we add 1 so that the very first day of the year is labeled as 1. So the Julian of the 30th of December 1927 is 364. Well, there are 365 uh, days in year 1927, and uh, this is the penultimate day of the year. So this Julian is calculated correctly, and it's quite intuitive. Now we calculate the Julian for every single sample day. For example, the 3rd of January 1928 is the third day of this particular year, which is also quite obvious. And this is what goes into the calculation of the angle of the sun. So to calculate the angle of the sun, we need to multiply the constant 0 0.4102 by the trigonometric function. Again, as we are dealing with spherical geometry, a lot of the calculations here involve trigonometry. So we go the sine function of 2 pi divided by 365, 365 days in a non-leap year, times the Julian of a particular day minus 80.25. This allows us to calculate the declination angle of the sun for this particular day. And then for the specific uh, latitude uh, nighttime hours value, we need to first um, understand in which hemisphere are we located, and we're located in the northern hemisphere, so we use the formula uh, at the top. If we were to calculate the nighttime hours for a point in the southern hemisphere, feel free to use the formula at the bottom. It's very sim similar. Um, the formula at the top for the northern hemisphere simply subtracts this trigonometric expression from 24, whereas the southern hemisphere formula um, presents as, uh, as it is. So for the nighttime hours, we do 24 minus 7.72 times the arc cosine of negative tangent of 2 times pi times our latitude, which is over here, and we need to lock it as the latitude of the New York Stock Exchange has not changed since 1927. We divide it by 360, close the brackets for the tangent function, and then we multiply by the tangent of the sun's declination angle for this particular day. That calculates the nighttime hours for each and every of our sample days. We can see that um, around the end of the year, 30th of December, nighttime hours are quite long, almost 15 uh, hours of night in a day, quite typical for winter seasons in the Northern Hemisphere. If we scroll uh, towards the summertime, we can see that the night is the shortest around the summer solstice, the night is um, shorter than nine hours at the latitude of New York at this particular point in time. Again, very consistent with our day-to-day um, um, uh, -day experiences. And now what um, Camstrade I'll suggest is to calculate the seasonal effective disorder proxy, which would be the maximum of nighttime hours minus 12. Again, nighttime hours minus 12 is by how much uh, higher nighttime hours are uh, at that particular point in time rather than the average across the year. The average nighttime hours across the year is around 12, quite obviously, and zero otherwise. Because if the difference is negative, it means that we are currently in the season when uh, nighttime hours are shorter than average, so days are longer, meaning that the seasonal effective disorder events are not applicable as daylight is relatively abundant. That allows us to calculate the side proxy throughout. And now we need to establish some uh, control variables that um, are quite prominent in other lines of research. So we'll control for the Monday effect, we'll control for the January effect, and we'll also control for days in the autumn. This uh, defines autumn in the sense of uh, daylight and nighttime hours, given the fact that if um, the days become shorter and nights become longer, we're still in the autumn. So uh, the uh, seasonal effective disorder effect is magnified with time, whereas if we are in winter, after the winter solstice, 
the days are, are short, but they're becoming longer, so the effect might be slightly different. This is the explicit mythological choice Kamstrad Al opted for in their design to allow the uh, sad anomaly to be different in the autumn months and in the winter months, depending not only on the magnitude of the effect, but also on the direction. Uh, again, from our um, personal uh, experiences, we can um, remember how some of us might feel relieved after the winter solstice passes and the days are becoming longer again. Again, the days are still short and we still might feel um, a little bit under the weather when we return home from work and it's already pitch black, or when we wake up for work and it's uh, not even sunrise yet, but at least we can have this um, positive thought, we can cherish this um, uh, fact that the days are becoming longer again and it wouldn't go worse uh, until next autumn comes around, obviously. So for this particular uh, set of control variables, well, Monday effect is easy to code if the weekday of a particular date, again, we use the two parameterization so that uh, one is Monday and seven is Sunday. If the weekday is equal to one, then one and zero otherwise. So we just label all Mondays as ones, simple dummy variable construction. For January, if the month of our date is equal to one, so if uh, we are in the first month of the year, January, then one and zero otherwise, that correctly labels all of our January trading days. And for autumn, we need to do um, a simple if function based on whether the uh, nights are becoming longer or are becoming shorter. So if our sad indicator is greater than the sad indicator in the previous day, then we are in the autumn, so one and zero otherwise. So we can see that here we are in winter, and when we reach to the first um, autumn observation, so here we are after the um, autumn solstice, where we've got uh, our sad variable becoming positive for the first time in this particular year, our dummy variable emerges as positive. And then it becomes zero again when we pass the uh, lowest point in terms of uh, day hours and uh, the highest point in terms of nighttime hours, and uh, it is zero until the next uh, autumn period. And now, to test explicitly for the significance of the sad anomaly on the US stock market, we can perform a multiple linear regression, regressing our returns onto uh, our SAD proxy and the three control variables. Camps et al. also control for weather-related variables uh, in New York. For example, they control for temperature and precipitation. Uh, we wouldn't do it here uh, for the sake of simplicity, but uh, bear in mind that if you want to replicate the original paper's design, you'll also need to include these weather-related controls. So we select a 5x5 five five range, as we've got four variables plus a constant, and uh, the Linus template is always five rows. We apply the Linus function, plug in the returns, and then plug in our main explanatory variable, which is the SAD proxy, as well as the three uh, controls. Then we uh, input one as we want the constant included, then we input one as we want the additional statistics included, and we enforce this function. And that allows us to calculate all of our coefficients that we can then test for significance using a conventional t-test, dividing the coefficients by the respective standard errors, dragging it across, calculating all of the relevant t-stats, and for the p-values we can go for a two-tailed t-distribution, plugging in the absolute value of the t-statistic we've just calculated, and the number of the degrees of freedom located in the Linus template as the rightmost element of the fourth row. And we'll lock it because the number of the degrees of freedom is the same across all four or five t-tests that we'll take. The main explanatory variable is significant. The t-statistic is higher than two and the p-value is less than 5%, meaning that the SAD effect, the SAD anomaly associated with seasonal affective disorder on the US stock market over the past 96, 95 years is uh, significant at 5%. Each additional um, hour of nighttime on top of the average 12 hours a day uh, increases uh, stock market returns by around 2.19 basis points, meaning that this um, relationship can be directly associated with uh, uh, lower moods and uh, uh, lower uh, risk uh, tolerance, high risk aversion that investors subject to seasonal affective disorder manifest. We also have got quite prominently a significant Monday effect 
and a significant um, effect of autumn. So returns are lower during autumn, when the uh, nights become progressively uh, longer. This estimation design has later been criticized for whether it's robust across different subsamples. For example, if you remove the autumn dummy, the effect ceases to be significant in many specifications. Uh, and uh, uh, internationally, this effect is uh, pretty well replicated and uh, relatively consistent across uh, uh, different markets. Uh, for example, uh, as the theory would predict, sad effects are much stronger in uh, markets that are uh, located further north, where nights can be even longer than 15 hours, which is the peak we observe for the uh, New York latitude. So the overall consensus uh, in terms of whether the sad anomaly exists or not is uh, still yet to be formed. There are some notable criticisms. However, the uh, elegance in terms of a behavioral finance explanation that fits well with uh, the uh, observed reality of uh, sell and go away effects or January effects is quite compelling. And that's all there is for the sad anomaly or the winter blues anomaly of Camster et al. on the US stock market and how to test it using simple Excel tricks and trigonometry. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm making to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you'd like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and support us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.